uh, in case anyone doesn't know, that's the UCR bell tower. It's at the center of the campus where I work. And uh, what I'm going to talk about today is a new study that we're doing that's going to make use of the science college at UCR as a laboratory to try to find ways to improve ethics in STEM research. And in particular, what, what I'm going to talk about today is the design of a study that um, uh, uh, that's actually a randomized control trial where we're going to randomize labs to different kinds of ethics interventions, different kinds of ethics training um, to try to enhance ethical discourse within uh, STEM labs. And so what we want to do is to try to make sort of conversations about ethics more of a day-to-day -day practice in STEM research. Uh, uh, and I was just thinking to say that, you know, while we're, this project is looking at science labs, I think that there's some things about the study that might be of interest to the BITS crowd because, you know, we're going to, we're introducing a new kind of uh, curriculum and training that might be of interest to people who want to apply this to social science ethics. And we also have worked out a design for doing randomized trials within a university, which it turns out to be immensely complicated. So there's sort of a template for how you might do this within your own university. In fact, you know, if, if all goes well for us, then we'll want to try to franchise this out like to other UCs or even to other campuses. Okay, so this study is uh, funded by the NSF, and it's a collaboration between staff in the UCR Graduate Division and staff at the Center for Open Science. I'm going to mention that my colleague Dina Plemons, uh, raise your hand, Dina is right there, and she's one of the principals on the study. Dina is a research ethicist, um, and so uh, and she works in the Graduate Division, and uh, we've already agreed that, you know, because of that, Dina will answer all of the hard questions, and, and then I'll answer all of the easy questions, okay? Uh, so anyway, uh, let's see, uh, what else was I going to say? I think that's it. So the, the last thing I'll say is the, uh, the, the title of our project is IREDS, and what's convenient about having the, an I as the first letter in your acronym is you can actually make use of that lowercase I, which makes people very favorable towards our study because they think it's somehow affiliated with like the Apple lifestyle or Apple products or something. Okay, so uh, the goal of IREDS, as I mentioned, is to try to make uh, discourse in, you know, to, to find interventions that will make discourse in, uh, uh, sort of discourse about ethics and, and, and everyday practice in STEM labs, and to try to get, you know, scientists to talk to each other, you know, regularly about eth eth ethical topics. And uh, some of you, like Skip, you know, uh, critics might, and cynics and skeptics might say, well, why is it that we focus on discourse? Because, you know, Skip is a man of action. He's like, you know, that's just words. What I care about is action and behavior, right? And uh, so the thing I would say is, you know, the reason discourse matters is because, actually, Skip would totally agree with this, is that um, there's kind of, at minimum, this constraining effect of discourse in the sense that if there's a culture of sort of discourse of ethics within a lab, then what that, what that means is then actions that people take within that lab, uh, people will have to justify those actions with reasons to each other. Um, and it's just sort of harder to be unethical when you have to justify your behavior. So you could think about, if I want to go about being unethical, it's just harder for me to find justifications that other people will accept for that. But if I go about being ethical, it's just easier for me to find justifications for that. So in that, just that minimum sense, ethical discourse can just sort of constrain behavior. And obviously what we want is if we teach people how to be ethical and what et rule, the rules of ethics are, then maybe they'll actually want to be ethical, right? And so that would be great too, but at minimum there's this kind of constraining effect of discourse. So discourse really does matter, at least in our argument. And uh, you know, so the, uh, one other kind of setup thing I'll say is that the, there's lots of ways that you can be ethical and unethical in research, and in fact, the NIH has this official listing of like eight or nine topics that counts as the responsible conduct of research. And you know, this is just one study, so we can't do all of those different topics. So in this study, what we're focusing on is just two substantive topics. We're going to uh, focus on uh, authorship and authorship attribution, um, which is actually a good topic for us to talk about because I think any of you that work in uh, teams knows that it, it can be a hard conversation to have about who belongs on a paper and what the authorship order should be. So that's a good ethics topic. And also we're going to focus on the ethics of data management, which is another good topic because it's oftentimes not as controversial, but it's something that oftentimes labs just don't really think about. They neglect uh, and they don't really sort of think about the ethical dimensions of data management. 
Um, the thing I'm going to say before I advance the slide, if you haven't picked up on it already, is the pictures are trying to tell a story. So in this picture over here, this is a, a botany graduate student named Christina, who I know, and you can see from the picture that she's uh, saying something very open and ethical and transparent about the blueberry that she's holding up. And you can tell that because her lab mate is obviously reacting. That is such an open and ethical and transparent thing that you said about that blueberry. And so we want to try to get lab, you know, the lab conversations to be more like Christina's lab than the kind of robotic and muffled lab that you might see in this other UCR lab. Did that work? Yeah, sorry. OK, so, uh, so what are our interventions? Uh, so in my day job as a political scientist, I work in uh, literature in, in a field where we actually spend, and Skip does as well, where we spend time thinking about um, sort of what are the structural or empirical conditions that induce ethical discourse. And, and where I study it is in politics. And so my literature is called the, literature, the Empirical Literature on Deliberative Democracy. But deliberation is actually a very general theory of communication, and, and you can apply it um, uh, to science as well. And so in this literature, there's kind of two big kind of structural things that we find that matter for inducing ethical discourse. One is the design of the institution uh, within which conversation occurs. So you could think of institutions, you know, lit literally as the kind of physical configuration of the space in which people uh, have conversations. And the second is the sort of the norms or, or rules about how people talk to each other within those uh, institutions. And so what we're going to do in this study is we're going to do one intervention for each of these two things, okay? So first, our institutional intervention is to try to expose labs to the open science framework. And I think, you know, probably most of you, if not all of you, know that the OSF is a, um, uh, it's a, this kind of online cloud-based platform that's, that's meant to help uh, improve communication among members within a lab. And so you could think just in and of itself, you know, if, if the OSF is improving communication within a lab, you know, that might help to enhance ethics just at that level. But there's also th things about the OSF that are really well tailored to our two topics of data management and authorship. So it turns out, you know, when you upload a project into the OSF, then uh, 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 people, you know, start, you know, add different components to that project. And as you add components, you're listed as a contributor in different ways. And so what the OSF actually does is it creates this kind of uh, empirical record of contributions to a project that can be sort of the evidentiary basis for a conversation about authorship and who belongs on a paper and who made what contribution. Um, and the other, the other thing is it's sort of, I'm sure, obvious to, to all of you that the OSF strong suit is, is in data management. And so, you know, the OSF is kind of well tailored to sort of you know, a appropriately managing your data and making the data public. So the OSF um, really ought to be a, this kind of ethics intervention just in and of itself. And the first time I said that to Brian Nosek, I was like, you know, you, the OSF is this digitally mediated ethics intervention. And he was like, yeah, you know, <laughs> yes it is. And so, okay. So the OSF is our kind of institute, it's sort of like you could think of that as sort of reconfiguring the institutional space in a lab using this online tool. And then the second intervention has to do with this, this stuff about normative rules. And what we find in, in my literature is that conversations are t tend to be much more sort of constructive and even ethical, if you will, if those conversations are, are moderated by somebody who's been trained in kind of ground rules about how people should talk to each other. Um, you know, compared to a conversation that's just a free-for-all, okay? And so we're gonna uh, do that kind of intervention as well, which is uh, through uh, an in-person training uh, where there, there'll be kind of, you know, training within the lab to teach lab members how to talk to each other ethically about authorship and data management. Um, and so what I wanna, and so those are our two interventions. And so what I wanna emphasize is that what our interventions are in both cases is, is training, okay? And uh, so we have a graduate student named Erica Baranski who's going to do be our OSF trainer, and the training will be sort of tailored to our, our project. And then uh, Dina Plemons is the one who's going to do this in-person training. But the thing I want to say about uh, our training is we have kind of two innova you know, innovations, if you will, that we think will make our ethics training more uh, better, you know, more constructive. Uh, 
yeah, than, than the usual kind of training. And um, so, so one innovation that we uh, have is that the training is going to be project-based, um, so that in both cases, the lab is going to learn how to make use of the OSF uh, in terms of an ongoing project that they currently have. So they, you know, they're going to learn how to load a project into the OSF and how to use the OSF on a project that they actually have underway. And likewise, the training that Dina is going to do to get them to talk about ethics will be applied to a project that they currently have underway. Um, and so this is, we think, is a big improvement over the traditional way that universities do ethics training. So I think you probably all know that you know, the way we normally do it is we tell grad students or whoever to go to some kind of online uh, web-based uh, thing where they read scenarios and then they get some questions about the scenario and they answer it and they get it wrong and so it says you got that wrong and it, sends, it tells them more things and they kind of page through that and then they finish it and press the submit button and they get a certificate and then they go back to their lab and they act, behave exactly the way they did before the training. And I think part of that is just because that scenario-based training is just too abstracted away from their actual day-to-day -day work. And so we think that the project-based training will help to make the sort of application of ethics very concrete to them and, and, and also apply to a project that they're accountable for. So I think that they'll sort of more deeply encode our, our ethics conversation because of that. Um, so the project-based training, I think, again, if you're going to do this, I think you might want to um, consider uh, project-based as a way to do, deliver ethics training. The other thing that we're going to do is we're going to um, use a peer mentor uh, s structure to the training. And the way that's going to work is that each lab is going to send a graduate student to work with the trainer that they've been assigned to. And that, that graduate student will do two things. So the one thing they'll do is they'll help Dina or Erica to, to actually load up that project and figure out how to talk about the project, um, right? Because it's Dina and Erica aren't specialists in biochemistry or botany or anything else, but the grad student can help them. They can walk together to talk about the project and to talk about the ethical Im implications. And so the, the grad student will sort of enable us to do the project-based training. But then the other thing that is um, really important is that the, this, um, sort of peer mentor approach is well tailored to the hierarchical structure of labs. And you could think about that, like if the, if the PI of the lab was the one who was delivering the training and running the discussion, then you know, the PI would say, you, know, you, know, you must do this, and everybody in the lab would be like, yes, master, we will do that. And it doesn't really lend itself to sort of discourse, but if the grad student is the one who's leading the discussion, uh, then that, 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 that actually you know, would probably invite other grad students and, and postdocs and research staff and everybody else in the lab to also be involved. And it, it also, I think, would help to kind of create this culture in the lab that says that everybody is entitled to, to have conversations about ethics. Okay, so those are our two innovations. I really think that those are the two things that are gonna make our training promising. All right, now I'm just gonna go through the mechanics of the study and then you guys can ask, uh, you can, Ask questions. So, um, so the two interventions lend themselves to this two-factor design. The sampling unit obviously has to be the lab, so we're going to randomize labs to these four different cells, and so they're going to be randomized to either get OSF training or not. They'll be randomized to get the in-person training or not. And then, and then obviously in this design that some will get both trainings. And so what we expect, and then obviously some will get no training. And so what we expect from this two-factor design is we actually expect an interaction effect because the OSF training and the in-person training are designed to be synergistic. So we expect to see sort of an especial, especially big uh, boost in ethical behavior for those who get both. Uh, so it turns out administering a study within a university, especially in a science college, is immensely complicated. And so I'm not going to be able to go over all of the details of the study administration, but I think this diagram helps to give a sense of just how we're going to go about doing the study. And so you can kind of see that there's um, a consent process and then uh, some exclusion rules that we, we have to build in. And then there's going to be a, a sampling, a set of sampling rules that we'll, I'll talk about on a later slide that we're going to end up using something called a group sequential design. But effectively what that means is that we're going to get groups of labs um, that have consented and, and are eligible. And then they're going to be block randomized to the four different uh, conditions. And then it just flows down. They're going to get a pretest survey. They'll get the training. Um, shortly after the training, they'll get the follow-up survey. And I think it's like six months after the training, they'll get 
uh, the, the post-treatment sort of major kind of outcome survey. Um, you can see that, uh, I'll talk about on a later slide, that in parallel to the RCT, we're going to also do a, an ethnography. So there's going to be an ethnography that's going on before, during, and after the interventions as well. Um, but that's the basic flow. These other things that, these other boxes I'll talk about on a later slide that it'll be important for us to note uh, compliance rates for the interventions. And we're also going to collect some data. Did we talk about that? We're going to collect some data from the match labs in the engineering school for, for reasons I'll talk about when we get to the methods slide. So, you know, so the main outcomes that we care about in this survey, you know, for the people in the OSF condition, we can collect back end data from them about how they use the OSF. But the main outcomes are going to be uh, survey responses, which actually we talked about at the executive board meeting yesterday about sort of what, how much value there is in asking pe people their own views about ethics. Um, I would say in our defense that, that if there's some bias in survey responses, it's going to be balanced across our four cells, so I think we're probably okay. But anyway, so the, the survey itself is really lengthy, and I can't show the whole survey right now, but you know, suffice it to say that it's like uh, sets of batteries of items to tap into their attitudes and, and self-reported behaviors. Uh, regarding uh, STEM ethics, uh, but I picked out a few items that will be of interest to the BITS crowd here. So we were asking things on the survey about, you know, their attitudes and ethics about data management. And then BITS, you know, you guys are going to be really excited. We're asking about pre-registration and making data public and those kinds of things. Okay, so that's what we, and, and, and uh, you know, while I'm not showing the whole survey, if you're interested in the survey, we have a, a you know, it's all up in Qualtrics right now. We're, we're, we're in the middle of piloting it at UVA, and uh, if, if anybody's interested to see the survey, we could share the link with you, and we would be elated if anybody was willing to uh, help pilot us, because you, you, know, you can fill in sort of your, your thoughts about the survey as you take the survey. So if you have any interest, just let us know. We'll share the link with you. Okay, just real quick, um, I you know, think it's totally awesome and fun and cool to use scientists as our subjects in a, an experiment Right, it's kind of turning the tables on them, and it, it's also cool to make use of our science lab as a our science college as a laboratory. But then, you know, the issue there's all sorts of complications and methodological issues that come up when doing research in that kind of setting, maybe even more so than a lot of other settings. So one is that doing research within a college sort of naturally lends itself to this nested structure of the data. So as I mentioned to you, the lab is our assignment unit. But it doesn't mean necessarily that the lab is the only unit of analysis that we care about. And in fact, there's kind of four levels that are relevant because we have the survey is designed that the items are supposed to scale up. So the items are going to be nested in people who are nested in labs who are then nested in departments just by the structure of the institution where we're doing the study. And so that's fine. So we'll just make use of multi-level models to address that, but then, you know, there's another thing that kind of a big implication about this kind of dependence, you know, this sort of dependence within uh, these uh, levels co complicates our planning for what our, uh, you know, sort of what our sample size needs to be because that, that nesting creates a lot of complications for thinking about how, you know, what, what kind of power we have. Um, and the issue is that, you know, so whenever you do a power analysis, you have to make all these guesses about you know what you know what your parameters are and everything, so you can back out a sample size. But then when you add this nesting and dependence, it it creates other complications because in some ways the nesting sap, you know is going to sap us of power, but in other ways doing the multi-level approach is going to buy us back power. Um, we, I'm going to we're going to do all of this in a Bayesian framework, so maybe there's ways to add back power back in if we wanted to in that way. And anyway, but it's just too complicated. Like you have to be a lot smarter than we are to really be able to say decisively what our sample size should be before we go into the field. We'll know after we do the study what it needed to be, right? And so, but the way we're going to manage that is by making use of something called a group sequential design which I'm just beginning to read about. It's, it's pretty cool stuff, but essentially what, what you do is you, um, you set sort of you know, what, you know, what you expect your enrollment to be. So, so doing you know, the actual kind of back of the envelope calculations, we actually think we're probably going to need about 120 labs um, to do the study to adequately power a two-factor design with the interaction. Uh, but we don't know that, and so what the group sequential design allows us to do is to take peaks at the data at different points of data collection in a and, and in a principled way stop the study 
if it turns out we have decisive results before we finish the data collection. Um, so we might, so, so that way we sort of, we're gonna be conservative about what our end goal is, but we can take peeks at the data and maybe if we're lucky, we'll be able to stop the, the study early and uh, you know, uh, get, get the paper out faster. Okay, uh, the other methodological issues are the just totally standard ones. Uh, so you ha you know, whenever you do a field experiment, so in a field experiment, you don't have the same level of control that you have when you're doing a, with, that you do in a traditional lab. And you know, one issue is obviously we're gonna have non-compliance. And the thing I wanna tell you guys is, it, I wanna warn you that if you do research on ethics, it turns out that you yourself have to do that research ethically. Um, because if you don't, you're at risk of being uh, seen as the world's worst hypocrite, right? And so you, so, so the, you know, with, in terms of compliance, the UCR graduate division, like the graduate dean is the PI on this, and I'm the associate dean, and it turns out on our campus, like we actually have a lot of power. And we could, if we wanted, if we could, I see Dina looking at me, and if we could, we could compel people to consent, and we could compel labs to do the training, you know, we could make them do that, but then that's, that's a problem because then Dina would yell at us, and so we can't do that. And so, so, as, so the long story short is we expect to have, um, you know, non-compliance because we're ask, asking scientists, like these, I mean, you know, like scientists to do something different about their research, and that's kind of a high stakes thing. And so, anyway, but some of them will do it, and so, but we're gonna have this non-compliance, but then what, what we'll do is just do the standard, you know, identification strategies that, that we teach in our causal inference classes, and you, learn in your causal inference classes. So that's, that's fine, that's pretty standard. The other thing that's interesting doing research in this setting is that we're really gonna expect to see, um, you know, there's, there's almost certainly gonna be communication between the treatment and control units because you're gonna have some labs in the same department that some labs will be in a treatment condition and some will be in a control condition. And we know grad students talk to each other, faculty talk to each other, so there's almost certainly going to be spillover of our treatment into the control cases, and that's this violation of sattva. You know, Peter and I have to have an argument about whether it's sutva or sattva. Yes. Uh, anyway, but the issue is that it, um, you know, that 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 makes it more complicated to identify causal effects because of that communication. Um, but what's interesting, and in, in normally in a, um, you know, in, a, in a, a design like this, you would see spillover as just a nuisance that you wish wasn't there. But in this case, it actually could be a good thing that if it turns out our interventions are positive things and they're spilling over into other labs, that means that there's kind of this multiplier effect. When you treat one lab, those norms can diffuse to other labs, assuming that the, the, that the interventions are good. Um, so we don't, so it turns out we don't really mind it and we, we can certainly expect it. And so, but there's, again, standard, ways to do uh, test for spillover effects. So like uh, Craig McIntosh and, and people like that have these designs where you can just sort of test the effect of spillover effects. And we're gonna make use of data from match labs in our engineering college, which are separate from the science college uh, to, to be able to, and, and compare that data from those control units to the control units in the science college to test the effect of spillover. And that's, that's the best we can do. Okay, just real quick, there's, as I mentioned, there's an ethnography is gonna go in parallel with the RCT study, and what we're gonna do is do a total of eight labs, two in each cell, and you're gonna have, we'll have the, there's an anthropology grad student that will set up with a duck blind in each lab. I'm just kidding, there won't really be a duck blind, but, the, but they'll be in there kind of watching what happens, and what's cool about the ethnography, in addition to just being cool in itself, you know, and having a qualitative component, it'll actually also inform the RCT uh, study because we'll have this qualitative information about things like maybe to get a handle on treatment effect heterogeneity or um, uh, you know c uh, compliance causal mechanisms those kinds of things uh, yeah and the last thing I'll say really quickly is it, it if it turns out that the that labs just nobody consents and we really have a very hard time getting any labs to do the study at all which could happen. Um, we would have to collapse the study to just the diagonal because the power requirements of just testing the diagonal are much, much, much lower than doing the full thing with the interaction. But if we do that, we're still okay because we'll still do the off-diagonal and, and do that for the ethnography. So we'll still get some information for that. So just to summarize, I'll summarize by saying, uh, by reading the slogan that we put in our NSF proposal, which is the IRED's interventions are designed to re-engineer ethical discourse within STEM labs to foster ethical practices, openness, and transparency. And you can see it already 
there's a lot of the life science college, there's a lot of citrus research that goes on in our life science college, and can you see it in this picture? There's already this light of openness and ethics and transparency that's shining through. Uh, the project team has, you know, a bunch of us administrators, anthropologists, political scientists, uh, a bench scientist, uh, two grad students, and Tim and Courtney, the meta science team at COS. Uh, Brian, what's his name, is, is uh, on this study, his role is the heckler in chief for us. Uh, and then, yes, I just want to mention we do have an OSF page uh, that's going to make everything transparent. So, again, we're not being, uh, we're not uh, hypocrites in our uh, methods. And I just want to say thank you for listening. And I, I want to take this opportunity to officially wish you happy holidays from the UCR Graduate Division.